My topic is homeward bound. A few years ago, I came across a verse in um, one of the old Review and Herald magazines. Let me share it with you, because this is the, my motto. I want to live a life, dear Lord, that other men may see the glory of your righteousness exemplified in me. Oh, demonstrate thy mighty power to make a sinner whole. Control my mind, possess my heart, and fill my empty soul. Forms and ceremonies, dear Lord, may serve an outward part, but nothing but your saving grace can change a sinner's heart. Oh, may I feel the blood applied and new life surge within. Cleanse body, soul, and spirit, Lord, and save from inbred sin. Then shall this mortal frame of mind be subject to your will, to think, speak, act, or by your grace be patient, quiet, and still. When I came across that, I memorized it. Well, I didn't memorize it, but I decided it must be among my collection of poems. Homeward Bound. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to look at verse 4. Before the foundation of the world, God the Father had a plan. Open your word and let's read it. Verse 4 I'm going to look at. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. That was verse 4. The church is called out of the world by God to be his representative on earth. We cannot understand or explain God. We cannot probe the divine mysteries of his existence. But we too can hoist the sail. Every single one of us in this place can hoist the sail. Think of it. We can expose our lives to God, to, to God. We can let him fill them. Jesus declares the divine indwelling, the intimate, beautiful relationship which the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit wish to have with us, to establish in each one of us as believers. And Jesus said in verse um, um, 14, Verse 23, he said, we'll come unto him. Jesus said, we'll make our abode with him. Actually, the entire text in verse 23 says, if a man love me, my father will what? We'll love him. And we will come unto him, and we'll make our abode with him. Think of that. Blessed are those. Blessed are, this is by far the most exalted privilege that we can experience. To have God, the Father, his Son, coming to dwell with us and in us. Think of it. Blessed are those who, moment by moment, open up their lives to the divine indwelling as he or she waits the ushering in of the everlasting kingdom. That's something we're called upon to do that moment by moment, day by day, to open up your heart to the Lord. That's a privilege. The character of its members depends, determine the character of the church as a whole. Did you hear that? The character of its members determines the character of the church. The character of its members tell the people out there that this world is not our home. 
And think of it. When people hear about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they don't think about the building. They think about the individual members that they meet and then counter with. sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, Inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in the which also you walk in them in times past, when you lived in them. But now you, you put off these things. But now you also put off these. We are people who think, feel, and act in harmony with the principles of heaven. For the spirit to recreate the character of God in, of our Lord in us, we involve ourselves only in those things which produce Christ-like purity, health, joy, and happiness in our lives. This means that our amusement, our entertainment, should reach the highest standard of Christian taste and beauty. The Christian is called to live a simple and modest life befitting those whose true beauty does not reflect outward adornment. My wife knows that there are certain clothes I wouldn't wear. The Christian is called to live a simple and modest life befitting those whose true beauty does not reflect outward adornment. But as the Apostle Peter puts it, he said, you should possess the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. I remember giving uh, Bible studies to a young lady when I was in the um, district in North London. And... Um, she couldn't understand why members of the Adventist church didn't put on a display of jewelry all over. The earring she was wearing was massive. And I said, you, you know, you stand out in the church. And she couldn't understand why that make a difference. Because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we are to care for them intelligently. We are to ensure that we receive adequate exercise and rest. We are to adopt the most healthful lifestyle possible and, obtain, and abstain from foods as identified in the word of God which are unclean. No one in his right mind would question the harm that could come to us, to those who use alcoholic um, beverages, smoke tobacco, and so on, and use narcotics. No one will argue with that. But you know, there are people, there are some of us who have come to the church and we still have the a bottle of rum somewhere there in the cupboard. There are some evangelical organizations that publish many articles enumerating practices erecting a wall between Seventh-day Adventists and other Christians. Their questions are, why does your church advocate a lifestyle that includes healthful principles, practices? 
Why do we advocate a modest dress code and beneficial types of amusement and recreation? Are we attempting to earn our way to heaven? That's the question they ask. Are we trying to be different for a different sake? Are, are Christian behavior related to the gospel? Let me state categorically that the cross reveals the utter uselessness of trying to earn merits through any particular lifestyle. No matter how perfect your lifestyle may be, you cannot earn any credit towards your salvation. The word of God says, Ephesians 2 verse 8, by grace you are saved through faith. It is not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Not by works lest any man should boast. So you can't earn your way to heaven through a particular lifestyle. It is by grace through Christ alone. But standards do not save. Standards do not save. They only demonstrate the saving relationship we have in the heart towards Jesus Christ. And secondly, trying to be different for the sake of looking different is rational, but there are reasons for standards. There are reasons for every standard that the church upholds. These reasons focus on Jesus, who was different, not in order to be different, but to make a difference in the lives of his followers. You remember what the people around them say when they saw the disciples who were following Jesus? Because of the, the steadfastness because of the purity of their lives, the people said they took note that they had been with Jesus. And that's what people want to see in your lifestyle and mine. If you're a landlord, you should be the best landlord in the land and not harass your tenants. That difference that we exhibit in following Christ is spelled out in John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief cometh not, but to steal, or to kill, or to destroy. But I am come, that they might have what? And have it how? I'm telling you, more abundantly. A key point in the gospel is the message of restoration. Gospel restoration affects us mentally, physically, spiritually and socially. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you through God's appointed representatives or directly through the scriptures, the committed Christian does not ask, what's wrong with this or what's wrong with that? No, instead he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? What will you have me to do? Or oh, that young lady I just mentioned to you who wear those massive earrings, she is a Sabbath school superintendent in their church right now. I'm telling you, Lord, what will you have me to do? Nothing is too precious for us to give up for God. Nothing. That is found in Acts chapter 9, verse 6. Lord, what will you have me to do? That was echoed by the Apostle Paul after his conversion on the Damascus Road, when he met the living Christ. And when you and I meet the living Christ, it'll make a difference in our lives. How we conduct ourselves in the church, we will not run away from serving the church either. When nominating committee time comes around, there's some people who make up their mind that they're not gonna do anything as if they own their lives. Whatever the command may be from God, the committed child of God says, obeys. If it means forsaking a cherished practice or habit, the converted child of God will respond in obedience to the will of God. And all who are bound for the kingdom, all who are heavenly bound, knows that a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in this life is the only passport that qualifies us for a life in the kingdom. Nothing else will do. 
The Seventh-day Adventist Church does not provide detailed rules regarding conduct. Shall I repeat that? The Seventh-day Adventist Church does not provide detailed rules regarding conduct. The church presents the basic principles of the word of God and asks the church members to live by them for their own good and for the honor and the integrity of the church, which is the body of Christ on earth. Amen. That's why we have principles. That's why we have rules. They come right out of the word. The details are left to the individual's conscience. Even meat eating is one of them. There's no articles of faith in the Bible said you shouldn't eat meat. Think about that. Jesus said to the Father, I have glorified thee on the earth, and the glory and the glory and the joy that the Savior had experienced serving the Father, he has passed on to his followers. He said, and now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given unto them thy word, and now they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. When you are walking uprightly, even when you don't open your mouth, people take note. They know there's something different about you. Don't set out to impress. Live the life naturally. People will take note. For us to enter the abundant life that puts us on the homeward bound trail, we must acknowledge God's ownership of our lives. Scripture tells us, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know where that is found, don't you? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. Christian behavior... The lifestyle of the follower of God arises as a grateful response to the wonderful salvation we found in Jesus Christ. Um, the song says, this world is not my home. What happening? I'm only passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Paul appeals to all Christians. I beseech you, therefore, Romans 12, 1 to 3. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a what? Not a dead sacrifice, a living sacrifice. And how should it be? Holy, acceptable to God. And he goes on to say, it's only your reasonable service. But when you think about the salvation that God has brought to us, when you think about what Jesus did, what do you think about the preciousness of it? It is indeed. Our response is only a reasonable service. God isn't asking anything of us which is not reasonable. Do not conform to this world, he said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable will of God. A few years ago, when I was um, living in the Coventry area in north of England, the pastor quoted from the New English Bible this passage. He said, don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold. Don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold. And you know, the world squeezed some of us in our own mold through the television. All the things that we absorb, the things that we enjoy, which are not uh, scriptural and biblical and ethical, it's the world shaping our outlook, shaping our minds. That is the truth. After a certain time, uh, before I joined the Adventist church, every night of the week would find me in the discos in the West End. And I mean every night of the week. And in the days 
even when I was working, I've never been out of a job ever. But even when I was working, I was gambling on the horses. But when the gospel came, when I heard, and this is what brought me, woke me up, when I heard about the sermon on, on Acts chapter 9 and the conversion of Paul, I've never heard it before. I didn't know the gospel. I wish I had time to tell you my, my story. It transformed my life. That night when I heard that message, I didn't know how I got home from Regent Street to, um, to, um, Will, to Will's End, Kensal Rise. Friends, <clears throat> Christ prayed, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So the lifestyle to which God has called his people enables us to demonstrate our full potential and prepares us to be ready for the coming of the Lord when we will be changed and given our immortal bodies. And that's what we're waiting for. You know, I look forward to that because uh, we lost a granddaughter and she was only 15 months old and she was never sick. She was never sick. That day when, when um, she died, I was conducting a funeral of a young lady who had jumped off a high-rise block here in London. When I got home, the telephone rang that this little baby, 15 months old, is dead. People ask me many a time, how did you handle that, Pastor? The strength that comes from God, that's all I can say. The strength that comes from God. But now we are called to be different. Being different advances our mission to serve the world, to be salt in the world, to be the light in the world. Of what value is salt if it's lost its flavor? Or light if it doesn't, or, or, or light if it doesn't put out darkness? Christians who have a relationship with Jesus as Lord will aim at simplicity in all things. The way we dress demonstrates to the world who we are and what we, and what we are not as, I repeat that, the way we dress demonstrates to the world who we are and what we are not as a legal requirement handed down from a Victorian era, but as an expression of our love for our Lord. We deny ourselves of certain things and certain pleasures because we're focusing on serving the Lord. Christians will not mar the beauty of their character with styles that arouse lustful passions. Think of it. But you know, um, be careful. When people come to church dressed on their half naked, don't, don't argue with them. Don't put them down. Don't turn them away. When the Spirit comes and takes its place in their hearts, a change will take place. Until then, you're just back beating your head against a wall. Let the Spirit do His work and speak. Christ, who is our example, lives so thoroughly in the world, demonstrating ways in which we can help to change the world with the genuine love, kindness, integrity, caring for the less fortunate, being a peacemaker. He also, he so consistently lived out God's principles that no one could prove him guilty of sin. In, he said that in uh, um, John chapter 8, verse 46, when the Pharisees were always getting at him. He said, point out, tell me where I've done wrong. Now, you and I are not perfect. 
But we please, we know we receive our forgiveness, our cleansing from God every day. When we come to Him and we offer up ourselves, that's why when we come to God in prayer and kneel at His feet or bowing in front of Him, acknowledge our sinfulness. We are not worthy. We are not worthy. And there's nothing we can do down here to make us worthy apart from coming and asking God for cleansing every day. May God grant that as we are homeward bound, as we come here Sabbath after Sabbath and open up our hearts to the word, we'll allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us through the week how we should act, how we should live in any given moment, how we should deal with any given situation and obey. That's when we are homeward bound. That's when we are on the way to the kingdom. David um, prayed in Psalms 141, somewhere I think about one, two, three. He said, Lord, set a watch before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips that I sin not against you. Set a watch before my mouth. Keep the door. You know how many times we err with this tongue? James called it an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Only God Almighty can control it. May God grant that as we consecrate our lives to him, as we pray and ask him to come in and to change us, this would be our motto. I repeat it. I want to live a life, dear Lord, that other men may see the glory of thy righteousness exemplified in me. Demonstrate thy mighty power to make a sinner whole. Control my mind, possess my heart, and fill my empty soul. Forms and ceremonies, dear Lord, may serve an outward part, but nothing but thy saving grace can change us in his heart. Oh, may I feel the blood applied and new life surge within. Cleanse body, soul, and spirit, Lord, and save from inbred sin. Then shall this mortal frame of mind be subject to thy will, to think, speak, act, or by thy grace, be patient, quiet, and still. The power of an endless life shall thrill me through and through, and nothing else shall be my aim but thy sweet will to do. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen.